Hello and welcome to Legislative Review on Prairie Public. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest this week is the chairman of the Education and Environment subsection of House Appropriations, Representative Mike Nathie of Bismarck. Representative, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You had a very busy first part of the session in your division because you had the higher education budget uh, plus a number of other things. Higher education, you were able to accomplish something that you said hadn't been done for 20 plus years and that's yeah, a tuition freeze. 28 years to be specific and it's the first time in, uh, that we've been able to freeze tuition and uh, you know we're in a wonderful fan fantastic financial position as a state right now you know and because of that we're talking about property tax relief and and other uh, programs that we want to give back to our citizens and we just thought our division you know what we're, we want to do some of this and do it in, in a form of a tuition freeze and give it back to our students and the families that support the students so we're very proud of that it's about 47 million dollars to do the tuition freeze it's a two-year freeze uh, it's one of the concerns I had was to make sure in year three that it doesn't springboard up and we were able to do some uh, things within the formula to make sure that that is smoothed out so there's not a great big jump after the first two years. So, uh, But we're very proud of that. Uh, the bill has a great, uh, we have a couple other great things in there. We have a big uh, capital construction project that's a four-year plan, about $330 million. And then we are also came up with a uh, crisis care mother a, a, for single mothers, single parents, I should say, that may be uh, in college and all of a sudden have an uh, unexpected pregnancy. They have children under the age of four. They help schools start programs to help those students to keep them in school, thus keeping them in the workforce. So uh, we did, I think, a lot of good things in that budget. I'm pretty proud of it. I wanted to ask about that four-year plan for school construction. Because legislators meet every two years and a legislature can't bind a future legislature legislation to do anything. How does that work? Well, you know, it, it, as you know, Dave, in the past, when it came to higher ed and construction buildings, it was kind of like the Hunger Games. Everybody came in and everybody was making their pitch to get their buildings built. Uh, Representative Steve Swantek, Representative Mark Sanford on the committee came up with this plan. I think it really organizes it quite well. And it's kind of each school's top priority building that they want to take care of. So it's on there. They have four years to do it. And the reason why we gave them four years is because they, there's a match. The two big schools get come up with uh, a match portion. The smaller schools have a little smaller match that they have to come up with. So we give them some time to raise that match money. Once they raise the match money, then they are entitled to the money to, for their construction project. So, and it does give some nice order to it. Okay. You had another amendment on there uh, concerning presidents who get uh, non-renewed and how, you, how they have to deal with paying off their contract or whatever kind of benefits they agree to. Yeah, well, you know, there was some consternation about the, the buyout package for the former NDSU president, Dean Brashani, and we had actually a couple amendments in that regard. The first one having to do with that very, very buyout, and the, the committee felt very, very strongly about this. So we came up with an amendment uh, that his buyout then would be buy, uh, paid through the higher ed office and not through the school itself. Uh, because the school was not part of the buyout plan. Uh, NDSU is in some uh, financial uh, trouble, and uh, we just felt it was a, a more of a fair process that since they didn't have a hand in the buyout, that that buyout would be taken care of through the, uh, through the finances, through the higher ed office. The other one we have is for future buyouts. And, you know, a lot of lawmakers like myself, we don't hear about these buyouts. We don't hear anything until much later when the public finds out. But yet there's a lot of criticism if a buyout uh, isn't written the way they wanted to. So the way that amendment works, the next time they do a buyout with a president, it will then mo move from there to the emergency commission, which is made up of the governor and the attorney general and secretary of state. They will uh, review the buyout plan. If that is approved, then it does move to the budget section, uh, where you have all the appropriators from the House and Senate will go through that. And if they approve that, then the buyout plan is, uh, is a go. So just some more transparency, some more eyes on it to see what's going on. No surprise the Board of Higher Education has voted to, uh, to oppose those amendments, both the central office payment and also going through the budget section and things like that. Their argument is, is that the Board of Higher Education has constitutional authority to deal with this, and it's a usurping of constitutional authority. Well, we'll see how that plays out, right? I mean, you know, it's the legislature then that has to pick up the tab and pay for that. So, uh, so I think there's arguments on both sides of that, but we'll see, uh, we'll see uh, how that plays out in the future. What were the 
some of the other big issues out of your subcommittee? Uh, we have the Commerce Department budget, which is a very big budget in there. Uh, you know, workforce is the is the key word up there right now uh, in the session because we are having facing major workforce needs around the state. Uh, the Commerce budget uh, helps with the uh, numerous programs help with attracting uh, workforce, with uh, training uh, workforce, and with uh, attaining workforce. So, uh, automation grants, those sorts of things. Uh, so that is really the big one of the bigger keys that we had. Uh, we had some monies in there for the uh, UAS, uh, the unmanned area drone industry up in Grand Forks, and we funded that pretty well, actually above the governor's uh, suggested budget. And, uh, and then we have another one called the uh, North Dakota Development Fund, which will, is kind of a closing fund to help companies come here, help them get them going, and then uh, spring up some businesses around the state. So that's another incentive for a company to come here. Correct, yeah. Yep. And there's and there's some talk about a possible fertilizer plant up in the northwest part of the state. Uh, we wanted to have some monies in that fund, so if that does come to fruition, we can step up to the plate right away and keep facilitating that plant. And if that plant were to come, it's you know, it's a roughly a four billion dollar plant that would take several years to build. So you're looking uh, about four years to build actually, but you're looking at thousands of construction jobs in the meantime. And if that plant were to come online, that plant would take a lot of gas off the oil field and would thus spur drilling. Thus it'd be more oil revenue for the state. And then the byproduct, the fertilizer, which would then provide most of the fertilizer needs for North Dakota, which we're having an issue right now in the upper Midwest. So if that plant were to come online, uh, it would take care of our two biggest industries in the state. So we wanted to make sure we had money in this fund to be ready to go if it does happen. Now, again, things tie into each other quite, quite easily. You talk about natural gas coming from the Bakken. Will that spur development of the pipeline that has been proposed for a few years now? Yeah, you know, we we put money we had put money aside uh, after last session, and we didn't have anybody take the RFP to pipe that gas out to the east. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do know there's some legislation working on uh, helping with some of the pipeline capacity, taking more of that pipeline and, and taking that in there. So, uh, yeah, it, it it's a it's it is a big issue for us up there. We need we have a lot of gas up there, and we need to take it off that field so we can keep the drilling going. One thing that Justin Kringstad, the pipeline authority director, said that there's still a lot of interest in building that pipeline. The problem was they didn't have a, a specified end user for the gas. But yeah. now with this other fund, maybe you can get a specified end Absol user. Absolutely right. Because, you know, with the plant we're talking about going to the northwest and with what uh, Mr. Kringstad is talking about, we're trying to get gas out to the east, out to the eastern part of the state that, that needs it out there. So, And then let's face it, the economy, the, the uh, inflation didn't help matters any either on that, uh, on that proposed pipeline. Another issue that uh, you've been, you dealt with, actually there's competing bills. House has its own bill, Senate has its own bill. It's about the change in retirement plans, possibly going from a defined benefit plan for state employees to a defined contribution plan. House passes a defined contribution plan, Senate passes a defined benefit plan. Are we seeing Perhaps this may be one of the final issues of the session. I think it'll be one of the bigger issues of the session, and it, it is a big issue. And uh, you know, w the state's not going to shirk its responsibility to provide a uh, the pensions to our, our longtime state employees who are extremely valuable to us. But at least the House plan is a plan that's going to deal with the newer the new employees coming on. Uh, there was n numerous talk about how the newer employees come on now they're younger, they're looking to be more mobile, they're not. Uh, a generation that looks to be in a job for 10, 20, 30 years. So the contribution uh, option fits their needs better. And we are in trouble. We're about $1.8 billion in the hole on this plan. And uh, if we keep going, that just keeps getting, our liability keeps getting bigger and bigger. So we needed to do something. Representative uh, Leader Mike LaFour uh, has worked on this for well over a couple of years, along with some, several others in the House. And uh, I think what we have in, what we passed in the House the other day is a very good plan going forward. And again, it doesn't affect any of the current uh, state workers in the plan. This will only affect new people as they come on board. So, so with both bills passing, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I suspect, Dave, that's going to be a lot of talk with leadership and as far as which way, uh, which road we should go down. I know that the opponents in the House and Representative Mock brought up that the legislature knew about this in the late 2000s because mm -hmm. at, after the stock market crash of 2008, things went south and there was a plan. He said there was a plan in place to fix it and there was four doses. He was talking about a cancer dose. And he said, 
We did three, but we didn't do the fourth, and now here we are. Yeah, and, and I believe, I think the dollar amount was maybe in 10 or 12, somewhere in that area. If, if we would have injected $400 million at that time, that we would not be in the position that we are today. And why, we didn't. Why didn't that happen? Uh, I, I, you know, you know how it goes when it comes to finances and funding. Sometimes there's other things that took priority at the time. This was not high on the list at the time. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all wish we would have did it now at that time. But I think we were looking at other things. We were looking at the boom that was just hitting North Dakota. You know, we were looking out west. I know that was a top priority. So it just, I think, Dave, wasn't as high on the list as it is obviously today. So it's, it's a, it was a real big missed opportunity on our part. So this is one to watch. Oh, absolutely. I think it's one of the top three three issues towards the end of the session as we get along, as we get down to that conference season. Yes, it's going to be a biggie. When some of us were thinking about the top issues, and you mentioned it already, workforce development, and along with that comes child care. So that's going to be a, that is a huge issue. The House has, has come up with some plans, correct? Correct. I mean, again, we, a lot of it's through the, uh, through, through the Commerce Department uh, that the governor proposed. But there's a lot of bills out there, Dave, that, that are addressing workforce issues. Uh, in the higher ed uh, budget, we try to uh, address that, too, uh, we, with expanding a lot of programs. We have $25 million in scholarships that we passed in the higher ed program. A lot of those are workforce-related scholarships to get, our, to get these students into the, work, uh, into the workforce here in North Dakota. I think uh, there's a lot of interest in that among businesses in North Dakota? Oh, absolutely, because w- w- all we hear is that they cannot find workforce. If there's one thing that's going to stunt our economic growth in this in this state, it is the lack of workforce. Uh, we need to find people. We need to find ways to bring people in, train people, and retain those people in these jobs. So it is the number one uh, 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 issue for a lot of businesses in the state. And child, car- child care is part of it. There seems to be a lack of resistance now for some kind of state support for child care. And I remember the discussions several sessions ago, there was an awful lot of resistance to that. Yeah, but, but again, it comes down to workforce, right? What, what will it take to keep these workers here, to bring them in? And if you have a parent who has a child at home and he needs some help with his child care, those, these are the things that business is going to have to do to entice these employees to stay with them or to come into their job. Is also a good benefit package, good pay. Oh, by the way, here's some child care that we can help you with too, to keep them. So businesses have to be nimble when it comes to that. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing right now. Another big issue is going to be tax relief because there's a lot of people who say, we like the income tax bills, and there were three of them that were yep. passed, or we want property tax relief. And this could be another interesting conference committee when it gets down to it. Yeah, ex- exactly right. And you know, when you're talking taxes, you get everybody's attention, correct? So uh, we had the three, uh, the three, two income tax bills and homestead tax credit mm-hmm. bill that passed out of the House the other day. It's now we're in the Senate. Uh, the Senate sent us the property tax bill over. I'm actually a co-sponsor on that. Uh, and it's two different types of taxes, right? One dealing with income and one with property. And property is always a, uh, always a hot button issue. So, uh, and there's a lot of strong beliefs on both sides of this. So uh, that's going to be one of the other ones along with the pension plan that's, I think, going to come right down to the wire. I did think in the beginning of the session, maybe both chambers and leadership could maybe agree early on something, but there's a lot of different opinions on bo- on all those plans. So uh, it just depends what your take is on it. I know that a lot of people say you hear most, most complaints about property tax. The, the conundrum is the state does not levy property taxes. The state can take care of in- income taxes, and those who support income tax breaks say, hey, this affects everybody who pays taxes. So there, there's a real, you know, Yeah, the, the, you know, as far as property taxes, you know, the state does control part of property tax because we control the education part of it. So we educate, we control about half of the property tax. We do not control the city and state. Uh, so we can control it with education funding. If we buy down the mills, then it's just less on your, on your property tax with graduate education. When you're taking a look at the income tax, not everybody pays income tax. Right, it's more on the higher earners, that sort of thing. So, uh, but yet those people deserve it. You know, deserve a break too. So that's why I think, Dave, when we go forward, um, there's talk about having a package, a little bit of all of this into a package under a certain dollar amount, and doing that. And I think the dollar amount's going to be uh, figured out as we go along because we're going to have the uh, revised revenue forecast in March, and I think some of this stuff is going to kind of be idling right now until we find out what that number is. Forgive me, I can't remember. Are you part? Are you on the Shiley wheel? Yes, I am. Property yep. Okay. And he has cut it down. What, there's so many mills that a, a school district has to levy in order to qualify for the formula. It's 60. He, the bill now is cutting that back to 40. So that's immediate property tax relief. 
he talked about a 3% and 3% increase in, in K-12 funding, but he said that's a placeholder because the, the March forecast that you just referenced could be better than that. Yeah, it could be much better. And from what we're hearing, I think it is going to be much better than that. So, you know, the, the Senate the Senate had, you know, his his original bill was from the 60 mills cut in half down to, uh, down to 30. Uh, it was not Senator Shibley's uh, uh, objective to go down to 40. That was done with, with an appropriation. So and I, with that bill, I think that provides about 18% property tax relief versus the 25% that the original bill had. So, And as far as the three and three, the per pupil payment, definitely that's going to come down to what we see in, uh, in the revenue forecast. And again, we have the uh, K-12 budget in my section, and that's going to be one of our big priorities to see what that payment is. So you're really being looking at that March revenue forecast for a number of things. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So we'll see what we have to have to work with. And, you know, we, we got some numbers earlier in the week uh, where we were sitting with the general fund money. At that time, we were about $585 million in the black. Uh, the SIF money, the what I call general fund too, basically, uh, we were about $135 million in the red, uh, which is unprecedented. Usually at the, at the halfway point, Dave, we are about a billion dollars in the red. So, and that's with most of the big budgets already in in that uh, summary. So I'm sure it's a little less now with some of the budgets that we passed out yesterday when we uh, went home. But uh, I think we are sitting absolutely in a great position right now financially. And I'm excited to wait to see what that revenue forecast is because it could even be better than we think it is. Now, besides K-12, what are the big issues that your subcommittee is going to be dealing with? In the well, well we, we have the water budget, and that's always a big one. And uh, uh, we have a lot of water needs around this state. Um, we, you know, it's 800 to a billion dollars worth of money in there for these water projects. So uh, it's something that we, uh, my committee's got a lot of work to do. We had longtime member Jim Schmidt, who is no longer there, was our water guy. And uh, he knew that budget inside and out. So uh, we all now have to do a lot of work and get up to speed on it. And we have been doing that all session. Um, a couple of my members have been... Uh, getting up to speed because we know this is a big one that once we get it so um, and water obviously out east is, is a big deal and uh, and and out west too but a lot of projects a lot of stuff we need to take a look at at least the diversion the Garrett the uh Red River Diversion Plan is off the table. That's, yeah, that's yeah, fun. we took care of that last session with a bonding bill and uh, took that money off the table. And, you know, and Dave, that's one thing about the great uh, financial position that we're in. We are addressing some of these long-term projects that we've been paying on for years, and we are able now to pay those off, basically pay them and get them off the table. So when we come back next session, we don't have to worry about funding those because we don't know what our revenue will be next session. As you know, we could have a good position or we couldn't. So um, I like the, uh, I, I really like the mindset of the leadership saying, let's just pay some of these certain projects off while we have this money. So it, it helps lighten the load uh, two years from now. One thing you'll be considering uh, pr probably will be the Mouse River or Suris River diversion project and, and flood control project for the Suris River there. And the Minot would like to accelerate the time frame because of construction inflation. Uh, have you looked at that proposal? You know, I haven't had a chance to take a look at any of that. As you know, we just, uh, you know, we just finished yesterday. So uh, that's something I'll be taking a look at here in the next couple of days before we come back in on next week. So uh, like I said, it, that's, I feel like I'm studying for a final every day when I take a look at these budgets. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's, that's the big one uh, in, our, in, our, in our, uh, our committee. And not just one person does that. It's going to take several of us to jump on there and, and learn it. And, of course, the other one is the potential for a Red River Valley water supply project yes, correct. based on times of drought, which is you don't think about times of drought when you've seen the floods in the Red River Valley, but in the 30s, you could actually walk across the Red River in Fargo. Yeah. It was down so low. Yeah, and, and they, need, they need water out there for not just for drinking water and stuff, but also for industry and, and for growth, quite frankly. So, you know, it's water and the natural gas that we talked about earlier, and we have that out here, and we have to get ways to get it out east to help because that is our biggest uh, highly populated area in the state, so we need to get on that. That's going to be a little bit of work, though. How do you do it? Where do you have the intake? I, get, I, I think the intake might be settled from the... from. From the reservoir. Well, I've heard some things. Uh, uh, they're, they're digging a big hole up in Washburn, which I saw last January. Then I've heard some other options. So I have a lot of questions about that when we go in here in the second half to find out exactly what this is, because I've heard several different stories from several different people. So uh, we need to get some clar clarification on that and see where, where we're going with that. Outside of m money issues, are there other issues that are really interesting to you that you're watching? Well, you know, uh, we had the school choice bill the other day that we passed in the House. And that brought a lot of a uh, lot of discussion, and uh, I've been part of that movement to, uh, even ten years ago when I was the House Education Chair, and we didn't get it through, but we were able to get it through the other night, and that is a big deal. I think uh, we have 7,700 private school children in the state, 
and uh, we were able to uh, help these families, give them some relief, because they are saving the state about 100 and, 150 some million dollars in a biennium by sending their kids to private school, kids that we as a state don't have to pay for. So, so that's a big one going forward. Um, again, I, you know, I think it's the workforce, the, the, everything that we've touched on already uh, are some of the real big things that we gotta take a look at. It is amazing how, how these are huge issues this time, really huge, but there's a potential to solve them because of the money situation. Yeah, exactly right. And we need and we need to be smart about how we do that, Dave. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, I think sometimes we, rightly or wrongly, we get labeled, well, you know, all you guys do is spend up there, spend up there. But we are growing. Uh, I've been in the legislature 15 years, and our population has grown almost 200,000 people in that time. So I'm a business owner. If my business were to expand that much, I would have to add on new wing to the building, add on new staff, new everything else just to accommodate the new business. And state government, the way we're going, is no different. The way the state is, and so, you know, there's growing pains. When you have this much growth that we have, um, you need to spend your money wisely. And I think we're doing that. We're very, I think the timing is absolutely wonderful with the, with the revenues that we're, we're sitting on right now because our reserves are full. Uh, we're ahead of projections, and yes, oil is is a big thing of it. But you know, you have to. It's how you manage that money. There's people out there that say they win the lottery. Well, within a year, they blow all the money, right? So it really comes down to how you manage manage that windfall of money. And I think we've done a pretty good job, especially the last several sessions. I wanted to ask you about the attorney general's budget because he has he has a a big request, and one of the things I was the movement of the crime lab from direct supervision by the Attorney General under BCI, well, that didn't, that didn't fare so well. So what do you think about the Attorney General's budget? Where do you think it might be going? Well, I think the Attorney General's budget is very valid, to be quite honest with you, because again, with the growth of the state that we've seen, we also have the growth of crime. And you know, the number one concern for our citizens is safety, and it should be our number one concern. And if the Attorney General needs more, uh, needs more weapons and, and needs more tools to fight crime, we should definitely take a hard look at that and think hardly hard about, about funding that. Because again, uh, Attorney General Wrigley, I know this summer had a press conference and he showed charts and graphs with rising crime and all these other things. And again, that comes with growth, but we're seeing people coming from Mexico with meth. We're seeing the gangs out of Detroit coming in here. So we need to give them the tools to help fight, to help fight do this. So as a friend of mine once had said uh, recently, he said, they are at war. The AG is at war trying to keep our people safe in the state. So if Attorney General Wrigley needs some more uh, tools and some more money, I say we need, we need to take a good hard look in doing that. I know the Senate has uh, funded, I think, the original FTE uh, request was 23. I think the uh, Senate came back with 15, 15, 15 or 16. Yes. So we'll take a look at the other ones that they didn't do. But, uh, and then uh, we'll talk to Attorney General Wrigley about the lab situation and, and those sorts of things. I'm sure we'll, re we'll re revisit the, the overrun and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll take a look at all that. I'm putting my toe in the water a little bit here, and that's the current situation, the uh, Sturm und Drang concerning the auditor yes. and the situation with that. What's your take on that? Well, I have quite a bit of take on that because I've been in the middle of some of that stuff, as you well know, mm -hmm. with the Commerce Audit a couple of years ago and those sorts of things. It, it's, it's unfortunate. I think the unfortunate thing is, was the, uh, the opinion piece that was written the other day calling the legislature corrupt. Corrupt is a very strong and powerful word. And if you're going to say that, I mean, that's, that's, you better have some backup and do that other than just being kind of thin-skinned and saying, hey, they're coming after me again. So, um, we, we, you know, the legislators are hearing uh, complaints about from the political subs from the cities and counties about the cost of these audits. And we had the bill up on the floor. And quite frankly, during the House debate, there was, there was compliments about, how, hey, they're doing their job, they're doing their job well. There was really no personal attacks. But I think the office felt that, that they were, the bill itself was a personal attack. And it certainly wasn't. I think the legislature was just responding to what we've been hearing from the political subs as far as the charging of, of, the, uh, of the fees. Now, there was some unfortunate language when a legislator used the word laundering and that sort of stuff. That's, that was very unfortunate. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, and that thing's still playing out yet. So the House gets the auditor budget in the second half. It's not in my division. It's in a different division. And uh, they'll take a good hard look at that, too. So you think cooler heads may still prevail on this? Yes, yeah, it'll definitely uh, will prevail. I'm sure there'll still be some tense. There'll be maybe some hard feelings going in. Um, again, you, you just don't get a call as corrupt and then, well, I didn't mean it. It's okay. I mean, those things will linger. 
So will that be a factor? That may be a little factor in some of the things going forward. So, but I have no doubt at the end of the, at the end of the day, Dave, we'll come up with a good budget and the auditors, and uh, maybe not everybody will like it, but we'll come up with a good uh, a good plan. Now we have a couple minutes left, and I really wanted to get into corrections because there are proposals, of course, for a new women's prison in Mandan. Yep. There are some talk about maybe getting rid of the Missouri River Correctional Center in Bismarck and having a new uh, mission for the New England facility. There's a lot of uh, chess pieces to play on that one, too. What's your take on that? Uh, again, that's not in my, div not in my uh, section, but, you know, I, I think it's needed. You know, we, we debated on the floor the other day. Uh, the $161 million a new prison was in the bill, was taken out during the debate. We had a pizza break there in the middle of the night, came back and put it back in. But I, I come from the standpoint, they need it. And right now, they're, I think, they're over 100% capacity. Uh, they have a hard time with some services out there because they're in New England, a ways away from health services and those sorts of things. So if we don't build it now, rather than, rather than costing the state $161 million, we wait another year, two, two, three more years. It may be $250, $300 million for the same thing. So um, I, I get it that it's expensive, but I think it's something that, that we badly need and we need to do it uh, right away. There's a whispered thing, and I'm just going to man mention this briefly, construction inflation is at least being talked about in hushed homes. Oh, yeah. In, in, in the higher ed budget, we had, uh, we had schools come up to us, and we want inflation money for this, that, and the other thing. Other budgets, we've heard the same thing. Some budgets have gotten inflation money. Some budgets have not gotten any inflation money. So um, we'll see. You know, it's the embarrassment of riches. When you have a lot of money, everybody then wants it. Okay, a few seconds we have left. I'm asking everybody, when do you adjourn? I would say we'll have we'll save five days. Five days. You've asked me we'll that before days. in these things. I'm always wrong, but I'm going to go with five days this time. Okay. We will get it right this time. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest on Legislative Review this week, Representative Mike Nathie of Bismarck. For Prairie Public and Legislative Review, I'm Dave Thompson.